Hi guys this is Hirasaki. This story is all about what if Naruto was part of the Avengers. Naruto left the elemental nations and wound up in a world where flying metal man, magic, and gods exist. Before we start kindly like and subscribe to this channel, and look over the description box for the author of this amazing storyline. Welcome aboard. Chapter 21, Budapest. Stark Mansion, Los Angeles, California. January 27, 2007, 1600 H Local. So, that's it? Naruto asked after signing the contract. He took Morgan from Pepper's arm and proceeded to make weird faces to make her laugh. Yup, I have two days to find someone to manage the whole thing. Tony said while checking over the papers and handing it over to his Pepper to have a read through. Is this thing, right? Pepper asked, disbelief evident in her voice. Which part? Naruto asked for clarification, his attention divided between her and playing with Morgan. Most of it. Pepper said, still rifling through the contract. She took the company information page and placed it on the table. Like here. It says that you have 2,513 branches already with another 57 on the way. I don't really know the numbers but that seems about right. Naruto answered, now playing with Morgan using a unicorn puppet. Tony and Pepper never saw him pull it out, but they just let it slide. If they question everything they saw Naruto do, they'll rapidly go insane. And it says here you have a branch in Pyongyang. How the foo, heck did you manage that? Pepper corrected herself since they have a no cursing po policy in front of Morgan. There's this guy with glasses that really loved my recipe. He tried to force it out of me, but he eventually gave up and agreed to place a branch there. I think his name is Kim Jong something. I just can't seem to remember. Naruto answered again, but now with Morgan wearing a pink fairy princess outfit. Tony and Pepper are gobsmacked that Naruto possibly served food to the North Korean leader, probably got tortured for it, and still got what he wanted. Pepper is now afraid to remove her sight on Naruto and Morgan due to the genuine possibility of another toy or dress Naruto would pull out of nowhere and give to Morgan. You still want to be in control of hiring of branch managers and them in control of hiring employees? Cause that's still a lot of work. Tony asked Naruto to keep his girlfriend's sanity in place. Yup. Is Naruto's only answer. Control of hiring of branch manager means that he can still place his clones to that position keeping each branch a safe house of his. Naruto stiffened so suddenly that even Tony and Pepper saw it. He immediately placed Morgan on Pepper's arms and said. I gotta go. I'll see you guys in two or three days. Naruto ran out of the dining room but peeked again before leaving. Have fun with that. He said, pointing to the pile of toys near his sit. The two then heard the front door slam shut. Pepper stood up and faced Tony and said. You clean that up since you brought him here. I'm going to change Morgan. Pepper exited the room with Morgan, but before she could get up the stairs, she saw Rody walking inside the house. Hi, Morgan. Nice dress. Rody greeted Morgan first before facing Pepper. Hey, Pepper. You see where Tony is? He's in the di dining room. Help him first before doing anything else. Pepper ordered before walking up the stairs. Rody just shrugged at Pepper's mood and walked towards the dining room. The moment he stepped inside, he saw the pile of toys. What the hell happened here? Rody asked. Naruto decided to sell a piece of his company to me. Tony answered plainly without further elaborating. So, Naruto finally decided to show up? Yup. So, what do you need? Tony asked while picking up toys. Rody decided to help him out before answering. You got anything that could knock out a herd of elephants from a distance? Rody asked, remembering the specifications the army gave him to ask. I might have some sonic cannons in production. Budapest, Hungary. January 28, 2007, 0130H Local. Nat. Nat. 
Come in. Barton shouted through his comms. His team of five is being peppered by gunfire from almost all directions. Two of them are already injured enough to keep them from fighting. Clint had already exhausted his shafts and arrowheads. He's currently using an AK-47 from a guy he killed earlier. They're exhausted and stressed out. They have been trapped for a while, and long-range communication looks to be jammed. Their only hope is that Homebase notices their lack of communication. The worst part of all, Natasha has been incommunicado almost from the time she split up at the start of the mission. How the hell did it go all foobar? Clint asked himself while returning fire. Flashback start. Boss really wants this to go smoothly, doesn't he? Natasha said. Yup, apparently weapons of mass destruction falling to an unhinged general's hand is a bad thing. Who knew? Clint answered sarcastically. The moment the package from the not-so-mysterious broker appeared in S.H.I.E.L.D. detailing an Iranian general buying plutonium, Fury already made up his mind on buying the information. Contrary to popular belief, the WMD the plutonium is going to be used for is not for a conventional nuclear bomb that just goes boom. It's for a weapon that aims to spread nuclear material over a large area. An extreme form of raised earth tactic, it will immediately make an area inhabitable for at least 100 years. When they got the details of the exchange, Fury took no chance and sent an overkill 10-man team, which includes Hawkeye and the Black Widow. The team would take a jet to Hungary, and a group of six would disembark. Four would be left in the plane for backup, and this includes the pilot. As soon as they arrived in Budapest, they surveyed the area and created a plan of attack. Clint would be overwatch, scanning the area for hostiles and unexpected occurrences. Natasha would be the infiltrator, getting as close as possible without alerting the buyer and seller. The rest of the ground troops would be on standby some distance away. There's no time to create cover identities and besides, it would be no use. The transaction would happen beneath a bridge by the east side of the river at midnight. They would probably remove any bystanders to keep any witnesses to a minimum. Everybody is in position by 10 p.m. The ground team is 50 meters away inside an inconspicuous van parked near the bridge. Nat went above the railings underneath the bridge and went dark to minimize complications. Clint positioned himself at a building 200 m away with a view of the north side of the bridge. By 11.30, two SUVs came and with four armed men each. They moved away all the vagrants in the area. They went on high alert in preparation for what's to come. At the stroke of midnight, six more cars arrived, three from each side of the bridge. Six guards came down from each side and created a perimeter. All of them are armed with HK-416 rifles. The guards sure mean business. Clint already identified the general, but he still can't see the seller. He needs him to move forward a bit or needs to go to a lower floor. Deciding that going down was his best bet, he collected his items and prepared to move. But before he could leave, he saw a semi-truck rush down the street perpendicular to the bridge heading straight towards the van with the rest of his team. He rapidly prepared an arrow shot with an explosive tip and aimed it to the truck. But before he could launch it, bullets hitting his general area forced him to take cover. We're compromised. Bug out. Charlie team, hostile on your way. Clint shouted to his comms. He saw the van drove away, but not before getting targeted by .50 caliber machine guns mounted to the side of the truck. Clint decided that he would be no help to his teammates if he didn't take out the hostiles aiming at him. He peeked over the ledge and saw four guys across the river, firing at him. That's particularly impressive since it's almost 700 m away from him. He returned fire using his explosive tipped arrow. Clint saw that he effectively eliminated the enemy and decided to help the ground team who was still getting targeted by the truck. He fired multiple arrow types, including incendiary, explosive, and EMP, but nothing seems to be working. Even diamond-tipped arrowheads didn't penetrate the tires. Get to extract point alpha. I'll find a way to get there myself. 
Clint ordered the ground crew hoping they will lose the truck along the way. He took one last look at the meetup site and saw everybody was gone. Natasha must have improvised or compromised for her not to radio in. The latter of which is the worst case possible. Clint rappelled down the side street using a rappel line arrow tip. On the alleyway, he quickly rode the Kawasaki KLX 450 or he placed for an emergency. emergency. He rode hard and fast towards the extract point while only using the side roads and alleyways to minimize possible contact. When Clint got to an industrial park at the outskirt of the city serving as their extract point, he saw the truck pinning his man down inside the warehouse. He also saw two teams trying to get around the warehouse and flank them. He quickly formulated a plan in his mind and determined that he needs to take out the truck if they want to have any chance of surviving the encounter. He slapped the rest of his explosive and incendiary tips to his bike and revved it hard towards the container at the back of the truck. The result was simply amazing. The truck went out in a massive blaze killing everyone inside. Clint runs towards his team while shooting at the flanking teams. He was about to kill the last member of the left flanking team when he reached out to his quiver and felt no more shafts. He hanged his bow around his body and slid toward the nearest gun and quickly fired at the enemy. How are you guys? Clint asked his team when he finally reached them. Not looking good, sir. Robertson and DeChile are out, sir. We've called for the bird, but we can't seem to get through. A member of his team, Murtaugh, reported while the other, Esposito, won triages the down members. Barton was formulating an evacuation plan when four more vans came. Multiple hostels dismounted from each of them, making the situation direr. Fuck. We can't leave now. Clint said to himself. He faced his teammates and said, we need to make a stand here. Hopefully, the bird would come and check out the situation when they don't receive further contact. Flashback end. Shit. When would these motherfuckers run out of men? Clint exclaimed, while reloading. He saw Esposito clipped at his shoulder by a bullet causing him to fall down. Murtaugh tried to help him up, but a shot got through the barrier and hit him near his kidney. Clint effectively became the last man standing when suddenly the gunfire stopped. He took a peek and saw a Harley drive down in front of the vans. Riding on top of it is a long-haired, masked man. The most significant characteristic of his is what looks like a left arm made up entirely of metal with a red star near the shoulder. Clint immediately knew who this was. Natasha had been warning him about this boogeyman for quite some time. The Winter Soldier. The assassin who would not stop, and it looks like they're his next target. He immediately took a shot straight to the Winter Soldier's face, but his metal arm quickly stopped it. Before he could fire another shot, the Winter Soldier took a grenade launcher and fired it at his direction. Budapest, Hungary. January 28, 2007, 0100H Local. Natasha woke up slowly, her vision still blurry. She shook her head to get rid of some of the cobwebs in her mind. She tried to move, but that immediately proved futile. Her hands, legs, and torso are all bound with leather straps and duct tape. Looking around, she saw that she is in an underground cell. Everything is made of cement except for the heavy-looking red door. She tried to find a way to get out of her predicament, but it looks like Faith had other plans. The door opened, revealing eight armed guards who immediately surrounded her while keeping 2M of distance away from her. It looks like her captors have some brains. When all the guards are positioned, an old balding Caucasian man with glasses walked in. A guard placed a chair a meter away from her in which the man sat down. I'm sorry, sorry for the restraints, Ms. Romanoff. But I'm sure you understand. The man said with a gentlemanly tone. Natasha remained silent. How rude of me. I'm Octavian Bloom. Still seeing no visible reaction from the Black Widow, he continued. The organization I represent was forced to ask you some questions, since you might be able to shed some light on a mystery we found ourselves in. Natasha is piecing together the clues the man is showing. 
The group he's with must be rich and powerful to be able to kill the original seller of the plutonium and impersonate him in front of the general all just to ambush them. There might also be a leak inside shield and a high clearance one at that, since the source of information came from Naruto. The chance of this group working with or buying information from Naruto is practically zero, since there is no indication of him working with illegal or terrorist groups. You see, we are a little envious of some good fortune that fell on your hands. Bloom said with a shake of his head. We heard you are being given high-quality information for virtually nothing. This Ninetales is growing to be a big thorn on our side, and I have it on good authority that you might have an idea who it is. That sealed the deal for Natasha. These guys are looking for Naruto, hoping to get rid of him. Bloom signaled a guard to do something. The guard walked out and promptly returned, carrying a tablet and giving it to Bloom. He then scrolled with the tablet a bit before showing it to Natasha. She saw Clint and his team pinned down. I can make, make sure they leave out of there alive and return to your precious shield. Natasha remained quiet. Who would you choose? A man you almost know nothing about or your friend and partner? Seeing that further incentives are required, Bloom scrolled at the tablet again and showed it to Natasha, and for the first time, a reaction was observed on her. Oh, you remembered him, didn't you the culmination of everything we have the Winter Soldier? Quite an effective killer he is. What do you think would happen if he targeted Agent Barton? Against everything she wanted to do, Natasha still kept her mouth shut. Death would come sooner or later for them all, and she accepted that fact for a long time. She would jeopardize one of the largest assets the world ever had against all that goes bump in the night for the chance for all them to live. I see. Bloom removed his glasses and wiped it before placing it back again. It's such a shame I can't change your mind. He retrieved a capped five cubic centimeters syringe from his pocket and showed it to her. This is another one of our innovations. The best truth serum ever produced. Only one cubic centimeter is needed to have someone to tell their darkest, deepest secret. Bloom saw Natasha's stare on the syringe. You noticed it, didn't you? I have five cubic centimeters here to make sure you would talk since you have some resistance against drugs. Too bad you would die within ten minutes, but what can you do? Bloom removed the cap of the syringe and stabbed it in Natasha's thigh. Natasha took a deep breath and prepared herself to butte her tongue off the moment the plunger is pressed. But before Bloom can push the plunger down, an explosion reverberated through the room. What was that? Bloom stood up and stared at the door. You and you. Check out what's happening. The two guards near the entrance unlocked their guns and exited the room. Distant gunfire and screams could be heard at the other side of the door. Door. This startled Bloom and shouted to his guards. Lock the door. Prepare yourselves. Bloom leaned his back on the far side of the room, while the remaining six guards all aimed towards the door. The screams are close now. Pounding on the door and pleas for them to open it can be heard. The guards tensed up and prepared to fire. Natasha felt fear towards whatever causes that kind of screams. It must be truly horrific to be on the other side of the door. As fast as the chaos started, the screaming suddenly stopped. Everyone in the room could see blood rolling under the door. The guard stepped behind Natasha to create distance from the door, but this proved to be the wrong move. The earth between Natasha and the guards are suddenly pierced with what looks like black threads. The threads pierced the torso of all the guards and ripped them apart in a shower of blood. Natasha didn't see what happened, but based on the blood and entrails around the room, it must be a brutal kill. Bloom, on the other hand, saw everything and understandably pee, puke, and shat all at the same time due to fear and the brutality of the kill. The door slowly creaked open, which should be impossible since it was locked from the inside, revealing body pieces on the floor. A man walked towards their view, and for the first time, they saw who was massacring everyone. He wore a black sleeveless top, pants, arm sleeves, and sandals on top of all that are metallic flak jacket, bracers, and shin guards. 
The man hid his identity using a white mask with a picture of a fox. The man looked around before staring at Natasha and walked towards her. He leaned down and moved his face in front of her. She waited for her to be ripped apart just like all the others, but what she heard next made her completely relax. Hey, Nat. It looks like you're in a bind. The man said to her. Natasha recognized that voice. Racing through her memories, she finally found a match around two years ago. Stealing herself, she asked quietly. Naruto? Chapter 22, Cut Off One Head Budapest, Budapest, Hungary January 28, 2007, 0145H Local Naruto? Ah. Naruto exclaimed under his mask. You still remember me. That's so sweet. A wide smile could be heard through his voice. Natasha's eyebrow twitched at Naruto's nonchalance. If she disregarded the blood and gore around her, you could forgive her imagining for them just coincidentally just meeting in a cafe somewhere. She was going to bombard him with her questions, but before she could start, Naruto moved back and stared at the syringe still in her thigh. Well, that does not look good. Do you mind if I borrow that for a while? Naruto asked before suddenly removing the syringe. Natasha glared at Naruto for not even waiting for her confirmation. What? You know you'll say yes anyway. Naruto defended himself before looking at the man behind her. Natasha saw Naruto retrieved a burlap sack with strange symbols on it. Wait there for a second. I need to do some business. He then placed it on her head to cover her vision. It amazingly also blocked sound since it suddenly became dead silent. Get me out of here. Naruto. Get this off me. Natasha shouted. The sack must have only blocked sounds from the outside since Naruto tapped her shoulder in a way that suggests he would be back. She was fuming at Naruto's audacity to place her in this position. She's the Black Widow for God's sake. Naruto, on the other hand, sauntered towards Bloom. Looking at him. Observing observing him like he was his prey, which was not far off. Bloom already pushed aside his dignity, evident in him ignoring his soiled pants, in favor of living and reporting back to Hydra High Council. This information must be brought back at all costs. He was about to go on his knees and beg, but before he could do all that, he suddenly fell face down on the floor covered in blood. Blinding pain came from his legs. When he looked at it through his cracked glasses, he was mortified at what he saw. Everything below his crotch is gone and cauterized. War does some fuck-up things to a person. Naruto said while playing with the syringe. You become desensitized to violence. To death. You start to devalue human life. Naruto squatted down to bring his face closer to bloom. Ever so slowly, you feel your sanity erode away. That's why I started to do some of these missions myself. To make sure I can vent out some frustration and retain whatever sanity I have left. You know, like what happened here. Naruto could feel the fear rolling off Bloom. Don't get me wrong. I'm not a bad guy. I should know, I met a whole bunch of them. All hellbent on ruling the world or be immortal or some other shit. Me? I'm just a flawed man trying to the right thing. So here's what I am going to do. Naruto grabbed Bloom's face and brought it closer to him. Bloom's eyes are now starting to the round black eyes of the mask. He showed the syringe to him and said, I am going to make you choose how you die since obviously, I can't let you get out of here. I can tear you to pieces as I did with your bodyguards, which is painful as hell, or I'll inject you with this. That's when Bloom surrendered to his fate. No matter what happens, he'll die covered in blood and shit. He didn't even try to beg anymore and stared at the syringe. The 5 cubic centimeters serum would kill him in approximately a minute with almost no pain, just his heart giving out. Hopefully, the man won't get too much useful stuff out of him at that minute. Minute. With his resolve hardened, he looked at the syringe. Naruto understood the gesture and injected the contents at his neck. 
Bloom immediately felt his heartbeat skyrocket, and his mind became hazy. He prepared himself to the assault of questions he would surely get, but it seems like he's only interested in the answers to two problems. But the questions he heard are the worst ones he could possibly get. What organization do you work for your current task, and who's your highest position mole and shield? Naruto asked with specific wording to prevent Bloom from getting anything past him. Bloom tried to fight the urge to answer until the time he would inevitably die, his consciousness is already slipping. Blood is pulling behind his eyes, making everything blurry. His blood pressure is already in critical levels, any second now, he would be in the sweet release of death, but as his sight begins to darken, he heard himself say. Hydra. Pierce. Bloom croaked out. It looks like the serum kept him alive enough to answer. He died with the regret of him spilling the truth about his organization. Naruto heard clearly what Bloom said, and he mentally noted to himself that he needs to look into the World War II organization more. He stared at Bloom's body as threads burst out of his skin to shred it. The police should be focused on the brutality of the massacre instead of the motive. All the blood and bodies would also hopefully compromise any evidence. The Earth Grudge Fear or Jiangu Naruto has is rather unique. Originally, Taki Gekir had given him the same Jiangu as Kakuzu, but reading through the Uzumaki library had given him an insane idea. Chakra metal is the most versatile substance there is. Conducting chakra through the metal can cause a variety of reactions depending on the type and movement of the chakra, as well as the intent of the user. User. It can be harder than diamonds in one second, then softer than cotton in another. It can be covered in fire and water at the same time. Only the user's skill and creativity is the limit for chakra metal. The idea was, what if the threads of the Jiangu is made from chakra metal? He can instantly create flaming swords out of anywhere in his body if he managed to do it. Naruto took samples of the Jiangu and studied it with the help of the Bijou. They noticed that the threads are somehow made from the cells of the Jubi. Its origin must have come from the Jubi's body parts that Rikudu Jiji has cleaved away during their fight, and it has landed near Taki. Months of test performed by his clones had yielded him nothing until he accidentally infused the strands with the nine Bijus chakras when he was practicing them. The threads turned into some sort of black blood that immediately switched back to threads when the chakra depleted. With that new clue, he finally discovered how to change the threads into chakra metal. Naruto piled up a thousand tons of chakra metal from the storage seal left by the Uzumakis and surrounded it with the Jiangu threads. He then channeled bijou chakras through the threads toward the metal. Slowly but surely, the liquefied threads assimilated the metal until it was all gone. The individual threads somehow became microscopic in width and metallic gray in color. What he didn't anticipate is all the threads outside his body can't seem to fit all inside him, that's why he decided to place a storage seal on top of his heart where all the extra threads could be placed when not in use. The improved Jiangu further increased his physical attributes, made him invulnerable to almost any attacks that would penetrate his already toughened skin, and allow him to create any weapon he can imagine. The only downside he can surmise is he can't take hearts anymore, anymore, which is pretty useless now that he can use all types of elemental chakra, practically immortal, and he already has his clones. The Jiangu returned inside his body, and the skin healed. He walked back towards Natasha and removed the sack covering her head. He retrieved a knife from behind him and started undoing the binding. So, how are you? Had a nice night? Naruto asked jokingly. Hurry up. My team is about to get slaughtered. Natasha shouted. The thought of the winter soldier targeting her team is giving her chills. All right. Sheesh. Just making some conversation. Naruto said as he finally undid her leg strap. Natasha stood up and stretched a little. Can you walk? Cause I can carry you. Naruto offered. I'm fine. Natasha said while walking towards some guns and magazines on the floor and picking it up. She removed some pieces of flesh on the firearms and strapped a Glock 26 on her holster and carried the Ruger 10 of 22. 
a tactical knife was also placed on the small of her back. After a final stretch, she looked back at Naruto, who had somehow dropped his mask and staring amazed at her. This somehow made her felt better than all the guys who flirted around her since she knows she doesn't exactly look presentable right now. Naruto, for his part, saw something amazing. A red-haired angel is walking around and gearing up nothing more beautiful than a lady who can defend herself. He can't help but stare at her. When she did that final stretch that highlighted her curves and face framed by her hair, he can't stop his jaw from falling alongside his mask. Natasha cleared her throat to snap him out of his daze, which worked. Naruto immediately picked up his mask and replaced it on his face. Yeah. Naruto said awkwardly. We should probably go. Natasha's raised her eyebrow to him and walked out of the room. Naruto could hear the bijou jeering at him to mark her or something, but he immediate, immediately cut the connection. He followed Natasha outside and saw her waiting for him. Which way? She asked. Ugh. Just hold my hand. Naruto said while holding out his left hand. Natasha just stared at his hand, clearly not believing in his intentions. For God's sake. Naruto forcefully grabbed her hand, and suddenly, they disappeared. Budapest, Hungary. January 28, 2007, 0200H Local. It looks like it's true what they say. In the face of death, time does slow down, and your life flashes before your eyes. Clint has been in many life and death situations, but this is the first time it happened since he became a dad around seven years ago. Clint saw her wife, Laura, during their wedding. The birth of his daughter, Lila, and son, Cooper. He saw the hardship of his training and the joy of building his homestead. Clint stared at the winter soldier, firing the grenade, and prepared for death. The shell moved slowly through the air directly toward his team. But all the preparation are for naught. He saw a masked man suddenly appear between them and the grenade. The grenade impacted the man and covered him in flames. That fucking winter soldier must have used an incendiary round. Clint fully expected the man to drop almost immediately after the round hit, but to his surprise, he's still standing. The flames suddenly roared high in the sky and then returned, seemingly absorbed by the masked man. Clint. He heard his name called from behind him. As he turned around, he took a sigh of relief. Natasha was running towards them, although a little paler than usual. Nat. What happened to you? Do you know who the weird reinforcement is? Clint asked rapidly, hoping to get some answers, but it wasn't Natasha who answered. Hey. Who are you calling weird, ungrateful birdbrain? The masked man shouted back at him. Shut up and do what you came here to do. Natasha defended Clint. Clint's eyebrows twitched in annoyance to the obviously a stab to his alias. Alias. He started back at Natasha, urging her to answer his question. I'll tell you all about it later, but the answer to your second question would definitely annoy you more. Natasha paused for dramatic effect, but Clint didn't appreciate it. That's the broker. Without a second thought, Clint fired at the back of the head of Naruto. It dead center at the back of his head. Hey! What's that all about? Naruto shouted, obviously incensed. That's for all the overtime you put us through. Clint shouted back, aiming again at Naruto. But before he could take another shot, a grenade exploded again, this time directed at his head. Naruto only shrugged off the explosion and absorbed the fire again. This isn't over yet. Naruto said to Clint before he rushed toward the Winter Soldier. Clint was giving a hard glare toward Naruto's direction before he was smacked at the back of his head by Natasha. What the hell was that? She asked angrily. Oh, come off it. 
The moment you saw he could take a grenade, you wanted to shoot him too. Clint said confidently. Whatever. Natasha said while looking away. I'll triage these guys while you give him support. Natasha was already walking to her team members when she looked back with a glare. And don't shoot him again. Naruto rushed the Winter Soldier and aimed a punch directly at his core, but he immediately moved back, pulled a pistol, and fired at Naruto's face though the fox mask just shrugged the bullets off. Naruto then ran towards him again and launched a right hook, which was promptly blocked by the Winter Soldier's metal arm. This had proven immediately as a bad idea since the arm was shredded upon impact. Everyone, even the Winter Soldier, was shocked by the development. The arm is made of titanium steel alloy reinforced with tungsten. The arm could take, take a direct missile strike and still be operational. Seeing the predicament they are in, the other hostiles opened fire at Naruto while the Winter Soldier retreated. The first ever failure of Hydra's Super Soldier. Naruto just stood there and took all the shots before he rammed himself against the cars and somehow making it all explode with a ball of fire. He retrieved a knife from his back and rushed all the remaining hostile and slitting their throats. When Naruto looked back towards where the Winter Soldier went, he's already gone. Eh, doesn't matter anyway. I already slapped a Hiration seal on him. Naruto thought to himself. Naruto was going back to heal the other members of Natasha's team when suddenly multiple light beams from the sky hit him. Looking up, he saw six quintets hovering above him. All of which are armed with 20mm Vulcan cannons and 40mm Bofor guns. Nine Tails. This is S.H.I.E.L.D. Under the authority of the United States of America and the United Nations, you are under arrest. An amplified voice said. Hmm. I should probably ask for a date. Naruto said to himself before putting his hands behind his head and kneeling. Chapter 23, Interrogation or Negotiation The Raft, Atlantic Ocean January 28, 2007, 0800H Local The Raft is built in the 1970s as a black site maximum security prison. Initially run solely by the U.S. Marshal Service, it is now jointly operated by the USMS and SHIELD after it's been upgraded in the 90s to hold prisoners with more superhuman abilities. The raft itself is a semi-submersible, self-propelled, circular rig that is self-sufficient and only needs resupply twice a year. The raft always stays at least 200 kilometers away from any landmass and shipping lanes to make sure it can't be accidentally spotted. It also always stays near the eye of the storm, if possible, to make it harder to find. The cells itself are modular and can be customized to counter the ability of its occupant. Any attempts to escape are immediately dealt with lethal force. If all the security measures are bypassed and containing the prisoners in the facility is futile, the raft would lock itself and dive down as deep as it can go while starting the controlled failure of the nuclear reactor powering the raft. As soon as the raft reached the bottom, the reactor would explode equal to the power of 50 megatons of TNT, effectively vaporizing everything in and around it. And this is where S.H.I.E.L.D. took Naruto. Romanov. Report. Fury said while sitting down on his desk in a room reserved for him in the raft. In front of him are Natasha and Clint standing in attention. Clint had already given his statement right until Naruto surrendered to a squad of Quinjets. I was on top of the railings under the bridge as planned when the other cars arrived. The general dismounted, but the surprise came from the seller's side. It's not the same seller in the file. He named himself to me earlier as Octavian Bloom. The general was also surprised by the switch up. Bloom calmed the general down and said, your original contact is a little preoccupied, but we still have your item. Natasha said, recalling the events in Budapest. Bloom walked behind his car after the general seemingly accepted his reasoning. That's when all hell broke loose. Bloom's soldiers are well trained and coordinated. They immediately took out the general and his guards. Guards. I guess it happened at the same time as when Barton and the team were ambushed. I was going to fall back when a tranquilizer dart shot me. It's like they know where I would be. 
She added the last part as a clue for Fury to not place anything in the report since there's someone leaking information in the agency. When I came to, I'm already strapped to a chair in some kind of by bunker with only a reinforced door as an entrance. The tranquilizer must have been timed since a few minutes later, Bloom and eight guards came into the room interrogating me. For what? Fury asked. The identity of the broker, sir. Natasha said, intentionally leaving out Naruto's name. The ambush on Barton and his team seemed to be a leverage for me to talk. They will let them go if I give information about the broker. They even showed me a feed of the Winter Soldier heading his way toward Extract Point A. When Clint heard that part, he had mixed feelings about Nat's decision. He understood that her choice is the right one, but it does highlight that one's life is less important in this job than information. When I didn't budge, he stabbed a syringe of some kind of truth serum, but he never got the chance to inject it into me. Natasha paused and took a breath. Screams and gunfire came from the outside. Bloom sent two of his guards to check what's happening, but when the screams just keep getting closer, he ordered the remainder of his guards to lock the door and prepare. Cries for help came from the other side, but it suddenly stopped. The blood rolling under the door must have left quite an impression, since they all moved back behind me. Natasha chuckled a little at the last part. I don't know what happened behind me, but I do know the aftermath. The guards have been shredded to pieces. Still can't figure out how he did it though. Clint visibly paled, just imagining what happened. Fury, on the other hand, remained stoic except for the subtle widening of, of his eye. The door opened after that, and he walked in. He asked me how I am, but when I didn't answer, he grabbed the syringe still stuck to my thigh and placed a burlap sack and placed it on my head. The bag must have some tech in it since sound won't get in, but I'm reasonably sure it can get out. So he used the serum to get information on Bloom. Do you know what happened to him? Fury asked but already fairly sure with the answer. Shredded to pieces just like the others. When we got out of the room. Natasha continued, leaving out some stuff. He grabbed my hand, then we suddenly appeared 50m behind Barton. It felt like riding the roller coaster a hundred times. She said, turning a little green just thinking about the experience. What's your psych profile on him? Fury asked. He's a dichotomy genius level intellect hidden by idiocy. Maturity in childishness. Seriousness and playfulness. He can be any one of this in a drop of a hat. He might also be a great actor, hiding everything he doesn't want someone to see. The only thing I can say for sure is that he would prefer a fight over a debate. Natasha listed off her hypothesis. If it were me going to interrogate him, I'll treat him as a high-functioning sociopath. She finally suggested. Fury sat there, absorbing his agent's report. That's when Coulson decided to show up carrying a folder. I got the reports here, boss. I hope you didn't eat breakfast yet. Coulson said before handing it over to Fury. I only had donuts. Fury said before opening the file. But it looks like it's too much. He commented when he saw the photo. The hell happened? Is all of this cleaned up? According to the techs on site, the bodies are either shredded or exploded. Craters, bullet shells, and bullet fragments indicate that they fought back their enemy, but it just shrugged it all off. Coulson reported. As for the cleanup, they're still not yet done. Only 40% are finished last I checked. They had to use hazmat suits since all the guts and blood are considered a biohazard. The local fire trucks are borrowed to speed up the cleaning. He finished. Clint took a peek at the photos and saw pictures that could only be seen in horror and slasher films. Fury decided he had enough. He closed the file and placed it in the desk drawer. Coulson could just report the findings later. How about our guest, is he settled in already? Fury asked, referring to Naruto. He's settled down inside his room, but the guards are losing it since he's been asking for ramen since he got off the plane. Coulson said with a small smile. Fury looked contemplative for a moment before he stood up and said. 
You three come with me. We're going to ask our guests some questions. Throughout the whole exchange, they never noticed the very slight distortion at the corner of the room. The Raft, Atlantic Ocean. January 28, 2007, 0930H Local. Naruto is sitting at the center of the room, bored out of his mind, waiting for something interesting to happen. The room is in is called the Omega Cell the highest level of security cell on the planet. It's a smaller version of the raft attached to the bottom of a cylindrical room. Below the cell itself is open water. Its walls are made of triple-layered cubic boron nitride glass that would allow someone from outside of the cell to see clearly inside of it. Once any of those layers break, the cell would be propelled towards the bottom of the sea then promptly detonated. A modification was added to this cell when S.H.I.E.L.D. found out Naruto can teleport. By continuously running alternating current through the cell, it would prevent anyone from the inside to undergo quantum entanglement outside of the room. Of course, S.H.I.E.L.D. doesn't know that it wouldn't work for Naruto since he teleports by accessing a pocket dimension. Naruto is currently singing badly out of tune about ramen when the doors for the overhead rafters above the cell opened. When he saw Fury come, come in, he can't help but ask. Kakashi-sensei, when did you go bald? Phil, Clint, and Natasha all tried to contain their laughter, but a few giggles got through. Fury now understood why Clint shot Naruto when they met. The guy somehow knows how to push someone's buttons. He reeled in his annoyance and projected a professional demeanor. Mr. Ninetales. I assume you know why you're here? Fury asked. You're not going to like my butt again, are you? Naruto said with a little shiver. This finally made everyone laugh hard. Even the room operators couldn't help but snicker. Fury's eyebrow is now twitching uncontrollably. No. Fury answered through gritted teeth. You're here since you may have valuable information that could be of use. Oh that. Well, I got nothing. Naruto said with a shrug. You don't seem to understand the situation you are in. Fury said while pacing back and forth. You are imprisoned in the most secure cell explicitly designed for you, in the most secure prison in the world that doesn't officially exist. You have no hope of leaving here, ever. The moment you even try to get out of there, it will launch you to the bottom of the sea and nuke the hell out of you. He then started straight in Naruto's eyes. You understand? There were a few minutes of tense silence. The people spectating are expecting Naruto to break any second now. Most prisoners of the raft spill their guts out just to get a lighter sentence in this place. The thought of living on top of a primed nuke is just too much to handle. But it looks like you see something new every day. Ha ha ha. Boisterous laughter was heard echoing around the chamber. Naruto is rolling on the floor, laughing. It took a few minutes for Naruto to calm down and stood up. Damn. I haven't had a good laugh like that for quite a while. Naruto said while wiping a tear from the side of his eye. He cleared in throat to snap out everyone out of their days caused by his reaction. I got five reasons why I'm not going to tell you shit. 1. Naruto raised his index finger. You think you're so intimidating with that speech and stare, then I got some bad news for you. You're just as intimidating as a one-eyed chihuahua. 2. Fury is definitely angry at this point. No one calls him a chihuahua. Naruto raised his middle finger next. You think I'm afraid of some nuke? I already took worse than a nuke. 3. Everyone was surprised at Naruto's assertion. Who the hell can survive a nuke? His ring finger came up next. I really have a problem with people in authority. They always think they're so special. All it takes is a simple knife to the throat, and you're in the same ditch as the rest of us. 4. Fury felt a shadow of a knife running across his neck. He can't help but rub it to see if he is already bleeding. Naruto raised his pinky. You really think I submitted to be placed here because of juiced up guns? Bitch, please. And fi finally, 5. They can't dispute his logic. 
Naruto would teleport at will. He has also shown the ability to tank incendiary shots. There's no reason for Naruto not to fight his way out if it came down to it. Naruto finally extended his thumb while retrieving a folder behind him. What made you think that I can't get out of here anytime I want? Naruto said the last part with a grin. Fury finally registered that the folder Coulson gave him and left inside his desk is now in Naruto's hands. So. Naruto drawled out. You want to start talking business? Fury finally understood the futility of trying to control a force of nature. He thought for a while, trying to work around the problem, but nothing came to him. It looks like Naruto holds all the cards for now. What do you want? Fury pushed out through gritted teeth. Awesome. Naruto shouted before sitting on the bed. You might want to start by turning off all remote recording first. Naruto said while pointing to a camera at the corner. Why? Fury asked, not really wanting to turn off their connections to the outside in case something happens. Have you not been listening to Nat? Think about it. Do you want for someone to eavesdrop and record what we're going to talk about? Naruto urged. The group finally got the confirmation that Naruto was somehow in the room with them. Fury recalled Natasha's report and remembered that there is a high possibility of a leak in S.H.I.E.L.D. He finally nodded towards Coulson's direction. Phil walked towards a control panel by the side of the door and tinkered with it a little bit. Sirens suddenly blasted and steel plates closed off all exits. They are now officially on lockdown. He then walked back to the group. Happy? Fury asked sarcastically, still not happy with playing someone else's game. Very. Naruto said from behind the group. They immediately turned around while individually pulling out their shield standard issue block 26 and saw Naruto materializing out of thin air. You can't believe how, how long I've been standing here. Fury turned his look back to the man he's been speaking all this time and saw him, or it disappears in a puff of smoke. Isn't this better? We can finally talk a little better. Naruto said while removing his fox mask. This is the first time Fury, Coulson, and Barton saw his face in person. He really doesn't look more than a young adult, but with whiskers. Fury signaled everyone to lower their weapons, but not holster them. As the group lowers their guns, Naruto pulled out a steaming hot cup of ramen. You want? Naruto offered while extending the cup towards them. When nobody answered, he pulled back his arm. Well, more for me. Can we get started with the discussion? Fury urged. All of them are still a bit off due to Naruto's antics. All right. Here's what's going to happen. I've got four pieces of information that you would love to get your hands on. They're going to be paired up since I can't think of four things I want right now. I'm then going to ask for payment for each pair. As a sign of good faith, I'll give the info before the item is delivered but after a verbal promise. How's that sound? Naruto laid out his conditions. If the information he would give is as useful as Naruto make it sound, he would probably pay an arm and a leg for it, but he has no choice in the matter. Deal. State your first request. Fury said. A backdoor access to shield systems. Fury is ready to object since it could compromise their whole operation, but Naruto cut him off. But with your confirmation and monitoring every time. The last, last part is somewhat of a boon for Fury. He can finally have some way to keep track of Naruto's activities if he can look into what he is looking into. Fury nodded in confirmation to Naruto's first bargain. Okay. This first pair is about what ingot from that bloom guy. Your payment would more than worth it for this. Naruto said, building up their expectations. Hydra is still alive, and their highest mole in shield is a guy named Pierce. Everyone was stunned at what Naruto asserted. Hydra was always believed to be destroyed after the Red Skull's death and follow-up operations conducted by the Allies. The thought of Hydra still operating and has enough clout to pull off an operation like in Budapest is just mind-boggling. 
The idea that Alexander Pierce, the head of the World Security Council and Secretary of Defense, is more terrifying than mind-boggling. Pierce has access to 95% of what Fury does, many of which are highly sensitive. His position would undoubtedly allow him to know the specifics of the operation Barton and Romanov would do in Budapest. The only reason he doesn't know about Naruto is that they kept it close to the vest. Ready for the next one? Naruto said with a smile while sitting on a chair that came from God knows where. You, in particular, would love what I'm going to say next. He finished while pointing at Coulson. What do you want this time? Fury asked while setting aside the previous revelations and working out what Naruto might say next. From what he knows about Coulson, he only really loves three things. His spy tech collection, S.H.I.E.L.D., and Captain America. All three of those things can have some earth-shattering information. Fury was fully expecting Naruto to ask for S.H.I.E.L.D. official badge or clearance so he can move around more freely. It would also mesh well with the backdoor Naruto was asking for, but nobody expected what he said next. I want a date with N.A.T. They should be used to the surprises by now since they've been receiving it left and right since the whole thing started, but Naruto truly has the skill to hit them blindsided. What? What? Natasha quietly asked after she regained some of her composure. Naruto still had the innocence to act somewhat shy. He scratched the back of his head and said. You're beautiful, independent, and dangerous. Who'd not want to date you? Phil looked at Natasha and said. Your choice. But you can still see a bit of pleading in his eyes to say yes. Clint, on the other hand, is trying his best to reel in his protective side and prevent Natasha from going to a date with a high-functioning sociopath. Natasha saw no reason to deny Naruto. She was somewhat attracted to him the moment they met. It's been too long since she had a date for herself, not because of some mission. At least if she says yes now, they can get something out of it even the date doesn't work out. It's been too long since she had a date for herself, not because of some mission. Sure of her answer, she nodded her head. Yada. Naruto cheered, not seeing the weird look he is getting from the other guys. Natasha, on the other hand, is flattered by Naruto's genuine excitement. Okay. For the final surprise. I can't tell you how I found out, but all I can say is that it's true. Naruto warned. Steve Rogers and Bucky Barnes are still alive. When Naruto started traveling the world, he found out many fascinating people in this world. To learn more, he used a modification of Edo Tensei to call down souls and have a conversation with them. It's generally a mixed bag. Some are full-on lunatics, others are as good as a saint. One of the people that he tried to call over was Steve Rogers or Captain America, but to his surprise, no soul was called. He tried again with the whole roster of Howling Commandos and managed to call everyone except for James Buchanan Barnes. Barnes. There are only two reasons he would not be able to call someone, either the Shinigami ate their soul, or they are still alive. And since the Shinigami is not fully present in this universe, the only explanation left is that they are still alive. Coulson is practically catatonic. Everyone else is not much better. The captain's legacy is what S.H.I.E.L.D. is built on. Everything he stood for is why Howard Stark and Peggy Carter made S.H.I.E.L.D. Seeing that the S.H.I.E.L.D. agents are in a daze, Naruto wrote a note and placed it in Natasha's hand before he high-reshined away. It took the group three minutes to fully recover their mental faculties. Fury was the first to recover at only 30 seconds. He tried to shake Coulson out of his stupor when he still had a far-off look in his eyes after two minutes. We have a lot to do. Is the only thing Fury said before terminating the lockdown. They were walking out of the room when Natasha felt a piece of paper in her hands. She unrolled it and giggled at what she read. Wear casual and comfortable clothes. I'll pick you up at 8 a.m. Take a leave, winky face. Chapter 24, Family Interruption The Raft, Atlantic Ocean January 28, 2007, 1100 H. Local. Damn. Clint exclaimed when they got inside Fury's office. 
That one word can summarize everything they have just experienced. Coulson is still out there, a little shell-shocked from the revelations, explaining to the administration of the prison that the lockdown was necessary since Fury noticed that the one inside the cell is just a fake. Of course, everything he's saying is a bunch of bullshit since they don't know who else might be spying on them. Fury is walking around the room with his checking every corner for anything out of place. Naruto's gimmick with the folder and revelation revelations further increased Fury's already sky-high paranoia. Natasha, on the other hand, is sitting at the corner with a contemplative look on her face while fingering the piece of paper in her hands. Clint only noticed the paper when they got out of the room. He surmised that it must have come from Naruto. Clint is still a little irked that Naruto, the invulnerable super soldier, got a date with Natasha. It's just trouble waiting to happen. But on the opposite side of the spectrum, he's glad that she finally did something normal that she can enjoy. Clint was thinking about the possibility of Nat finally finding someone to settle down with when he heard the door open. He looked back behind him and saw Coulson walking in. Fury sat back down when he is finally sure enough that there's no one else in the room or someone listening in. This signaled everyone to stand in attention in front of Fury. Did they buy it? Fury asked Coulson. Yup. They're just really pissed off about it. Phil answered with a shrug. Good. Fury said with a nod. This goes without saying. No one would discuss anything about what happened here unless I explicitly and personally give the go-ahead. Is that clear? They all nodded in confirmation. The aftermath that would happen if any of the information said today gets out haphazardly would be catastrophic. Who knows how many Hydra agents are still around, or worse yet, in S.H.I.E.L.D. They need to plan every step of the way by themselves with minimal involvement outside of their group. Maria Hill would also need to be informed about this development since she's Fury's closest right-hand woman. The logistics of setting everything up would be a nightmare without her. Boss. I would like to follow up on some leads he gave us. Coulson requested. Which one? Cause there is a whole bunch of shit we would need to go through. Fury inquired. The one about Rogers and Barnes. Why? Fury urged Coulson to explain his reasoning. The crisis looming over our heads would not only affect S.H.I.E.L.D., sir. It would disrupt, disrupt some fundamental beliefs held by everyone. When the inevitable shakeup happens, a new symbol needs to be placed for everyone to rally behind. Who better for it to be the captain himself? Coulson reasoned with conviction. Are you sure it's not because you just want to find the captain? Fury asked slightly in jest. That's just a bonus, sir. Coulson defended himself with a smile. Okay. You have clearance. I want you to compile everything about Rogers and Barnes in a remote network. Make sure it can't be hacked or copied. When you have everything, we'll talk about a search party. Fury laid out the plan he wanted Coulson to follow. Security and anonymity is their friend as long as they haven't flushed out the rats in the division. How long have you been preparing for that speech of yours? Half an hour. Phil answered with a shrug. Now that's out of the way. It's time to talk about the next pressing issue. Fury said before facing Natasha. Romanoff's date with a teleporting super soldier with sociopathic tendencies. Clint perked up, hearing the next topic of conversation while Coulson was pulled out of his thought about how to approach the problem with the captain. Natasha saw the reaction of her co-workers and immediately knew she would loathe the next few minutes. We need to prepare a strike team and an air support package. Clint said seriously. We should probably also place a quick response team and two surveillance teams to follow. Coulson added. Phil believes that Natasha could take care of herself in most situations. So, if something happens during their outing, she can take care of herself, and if in case the problem is Naruto himself, they can't do anything about it. So, in summary, he just said his suggestion to rile up Romanov. Natasha can't believe at the two's audacity. Are they saying that she's incompetent, incompetent, or incapable? Besides, the whole thing is private. 
Why the hell would they make it into a high-stakes mission scenario? She gets it that Naruto is a huge question mark, and nobody likes an unknown. She also understands that he's still a national security threat, but for the love of God. They're just going on a date. The only thing stopping her from an outburst is because Fury is in the room. Phil is looking at Natasha in the corner of his vision. He's enjoying the play-by-play -play of emotions that can be seen on her face. It's a rarity that he can mess with the infamous Black Widow. Clint, on the other hand, is utterly oblivious to the peril he's placing himself in. He somehow decided to take on the role of the overprotective brother while disregarding Natasha's opinion. Although amused with the play-by-play, -play, Fury would like to get on with the conversation without losing two of his agents in the process. Your suggestions have some merit. Natasha was about to interject, but Fury continued effectively cutting her off. Romanov can take care of herself, and in case something goes wrong that is out of her league, she would take with her an emergency band and her phone. Is that acceptable? The emergency band is a watch designed by S.H.I.E.L.D. for tracking high-profile protectees during a mission. It can transmit and receive data from almost anywhere on the surface of the Earth. The location and vitals are continuously sent to command while messages and orders can be sent back and read through the watch face. The user can also send a distress call that would immediately alert that something went wrong. Everyone, everyone naturally agreed to Fury's decision, although Natasha is still miffed about her being tracked, it would be a lot better than being listened to. What Fury didn't say to Romanov is that the band she is going to wear would have the capabilities to listen in and has a live video feed. Coulson, prepare the jet. The earlier we get back, the better. Fury ordered before walking out of the room. Coulson followed and walked out of the room to execute Fury's orders. It can take them from one hour to seven hours to get back to Washington, depending on where the raft is currently. Barton walked over to a locker at the corner of the room to retrieve his bow and quiver since the raft policy state that only handguns are allowed for anyone who is not a member of the raft's security team. Fuck. I'm going to kill him. Barton suddenly shouted. Natasha already knew through experience what might have happened, and she was not disappointed when she saw what's inside. Instead of Clint's black carbon nanotube composite bow and high-tech quiver, it was replaced by a set of colorful toy bow and suction-tipped arrows. A message is taped at the back wall of the locker. Told you we aren't done yet, P. P.S. You'll get it back after the date. Stark Mansion, Los Angeles, California. January 28, 2007, 0800H Local. Tony, Happy, and Rody was roped in another one of Pepper's crazy house rules. If you're not a guest and present inside the house early in the morning, you would have to help out in making breakfast. And not just simple toast, it has to be an English breakfast because breakfast is the most important meal of the day. On top of all that, Pepper is such a control freak. She just hides it well. That's why it Happy and Rody rarely came to the Stark household so early in the morning. They were present that morning was because Tony texted them that he needed help. The son of a bitch just wanted someone to suffer with him. Tony was assigned to cooking the beans, Happy is frying the meat and eggs, Rody is squeezing some oranges, and finally, Pepper is preparing the salad. They were all, were all doing the jobs when Jarvis's voice was heard from the speaker. Sir. Miss Morgan is finally awake. She looks like she requires diaper change. Jarvis informed them. Tony and Pepper stared at each other. They were silently debating who's going to change Morgan's diaper. Rody and Happy are still amused by how great the two of them together. After a few more seconds, Pepper finally stood up. It looks like she lost the debate. She washed her hands before starting to walk out of the room, but before she could leave the kitchen, Jarvis's voice was heard again. Miss Potts. It looks like Miss Morgan is already being tended to. Oh. Thank you, Jarvis. Pepper replied before walking back to finish the salad preparation. It's still a little weird for her to talk with someone who only exists as ones and zeros, but she's slowly coming around on that idea. She just sat back down and prepared the salad when she realized something. 
there were supposed to be only four people inside the house, excluding Morgan. If all of them are now preparing breakfast, who the hell is with Morgan? At the same time, the others with her also realized the situation. They all stood up simultaneously and ran up the stairs, while making sure they individually brought some kind of weapon. Tony brought a spatula, Happy dumped the food here cooking on a plate and carried the pan, and Pepper brought a wooden spoon. Only Rody brought a real weapon, which is his service firearm. As they were reaching the door, Rody and Happy pulled Tony and Pepper to the back. It's better if someone with experience handles the first encounter. Happy signaled that he would open the door while Rody would storm inside Morgan's room. Tony is holding Pepper back who's on the verge of a panic attack. Rody raised three fingers and counted down. As soon as it reached zero, Happy quickly opened the door while Rody rushed in. Turn around with your hands up. Rody shouted while pointing the gun at the man standing with his back facing them. Morgan's cry suddenly reverberated inside the darkened room. Tony and Pepper took a peek inside the room, trying to see if their baby girl is okay. The tension was rising at an exponential rate until it abruptly crashed back down. Great. You just made her cry. Happy now. A voice can be heard even for the people outside the room. Happy decided to end the mystery and open the light. What they saw relieved and annoyed Pepper at the same time. Naruto is carrying Morgan while feeding her. Rody, on the other hand, is still tensed since he hasn't met Naruto personally yet. Only snippets from conversations. Tony, visibly more relaxed, strolled in between Rody and Naruto. Rody, Naruto. Naruto, Rody. Tony introduced them. Now, put the gun down before you accidentally shoot someone. Tony then gave Naruto a hard stare. You. When did you get back? 30 minutes ago. Why? Naruto asked. Before Tony could answer, Pepper interjected in the conversation. The intensity of her glare was enough to scare Naruto and making him step back. Why didn't you say you're already here, and how did you get in? You almost gave me a heart attack. Pepper shouted straight to Naruto's face. The loud sound made Morgan cry again. Naruto involuntarily gulped in fear. He started to sway a little to calm down Morgan, who's been fuzzing around. I thought you already know since Jarvis is installed into your security system, as for the entrance, I used the window. Some guys are keeping an eye on your house, and I don't want to cause some problems. Naruto defended himself, lacking his usual energetic personality. What guys? Paparazzi? Happy asked. As the head of security, he should deal with some possibly unsavory entities looking into the family's personal life. I don't know, but it doesn't look like it. They wore suits and have guns. If you think about it, they might be some government spooks. They've been there even before I arrived. Naruto said with a shrug. Happy's internal alarms started ringing. Who the hell gave anyone the authority to survey the Starks? Excuse me. I got to look into it. Happy said before walking out of the room. Presumably, to call some of his contacts. When Pepper calmed down considerably, she finally pulled Naruto out of the room while still carrying Morgan. Tony and Rody just followed behind them. Naruto can't even resist since he might jostle Morgan. When they got to the entrance of the kitchen, Pepper took Morgan and pushed Naruto into the kitchen. You're going to finish preparing everyone's breakfast. You got 20 minutes. Pepper said in an authoritative tone. And? No. Ramen. She added before walking away. Chapter 25, Not Exactly a Secret. Stark Mansion, Los Angeles, California. January 28, 2007, 0930H Local. Okay. New rule. Naruto cooks every time he's here. Pepper moaned out when she tasted Naruto's version of English breakfast. She had no idea how Naruto converted their half-cooked meals to one of the most glorious meals she ever had. 
she finally understood why Shikugakure is hauling cash. With Naruto's recipe, everyone would be tripping over themselves for it. Seconded. Tony said vehemently. If he's cooking, call me anytime. Rodi said. How the hell did you make freshly squeezed OJ this good? While everyone was praising Naruto for his cooking, he's sitting on the corner of table pouting while eating. He can't believe Pepper would ban ramen. As they were eating, Happy decided to walk in, looking a little pissed. So, I just got off talking to Kate, do you know what she said? Happy said to Tony while holding his phone. Who's Kate? Kate. Tony asked, being a rich ex-playboy really makes it hard to distinguish female names sometimes. Kate Macer. Happy said, expecting Tony to remember her. You know, assistant director of the FBI Kate Macer. Tony still didn't recognize the name. Happy hated to continue, but he wanted Tony to remember her to make the following conversation easier. 2K turn of the century party, redhead in a black dress. Happy finally said, reminding Tony of the night they met and supposedly had a one-night stand. Damn. The one who looks like a model? She's AD now? Tony asked unintentionally slipping more than he wanted to say, which caused Pepper to slap Tony in the arm and give him a disapproving stare. Anyways. Happy continued hoping to continue the conversation. He served himself some breakfast. She said there are no spooks assigned to you guys or your house. That includes the CIA, NSA, Homeland, and DOD. She's going to send someone to look into it. Happy said before taking a bite of the eggs and bacon. Damn. This is good. Rody. Try to find something on your end. I don't want anyone else to know about Morgan. Tony said seriously. No problem. I have some black ops contacts. Maybe it's something from there. Rody replied. Being relatively high-ranked personnel, he acknowledges that the military and other agencies are always doing questionable stuff. Tony also has some experience with black ops, since they first test a lot of his projects. Why don't you let me handle them? It'll only take a few minutes. Naruto off-handedly suggested. You? Ha! Come on! It's one thing to take our mob thugs by surprise but dealing with trained agents? That's a whole other ballpark. Rody exclaimed. His pride doesn't want to concede that some guy would be able to hold himself against rigorously trained agents. Wait a second. I saw what he could do. If no one officially sanctioned the guys surveilling us, Naruto could take them down now and ask questions later. Tony explained. He was seriously considering sicking Naruto against those guys. There's no one taking down anyone. We are going to finish this nice breakfast and let that FBI AD handle the situation. Pepper said, chastising everyone while adding a little bite when referring to the Kate Macer. Pepper faced Naruto and asked, so what got you in a rush the other day? Oh. I got a date. Naruto said with a wide smile. You ran out of the house in a hurry to get a date? Why the hell did it take you a day and a half to get a date? Tony asked incredulously. Well, there was an emergency I have to look into. That took me around a day to straighten out, but by the end of the day, I got a date. I've meant to ask her out for some time, but responsibilities got in the way. Naruto explained. So, you knew her for quite a while. Pepper asked, suddenly interested in the conversation. Not exactly, it's more of an I know of her kind of situation, but we already met personally before. She hot. Rody asked without tact. Oh yeah, definitely. Naruto answered with a grin. But it's more than that. Pepper appreciated that Naruto asked a girl out not only because of her look. She can hurt you more ways than you can imagine. The woman can defend herself. That's when Pepper knew she spoke too soon. What? Is she a cop or a soldier? Happy asked. Nope. Naruto answered with a mischievous smile. 
Pepper had that bad feeling again. Every time she saw Naruto with that smile, she just knew another headache is coming her way. She's a spy. Yup, that migraine is going to hit her hard. Rodi, who decided that it was the right time to drink some OJ, spat everything behind him and went into a coughing fit. How the hell did you meet a spy? Tony asked, completely ignoring his best friend's predicament. Remember how I said I lost all my stuff on the way to Vegas? Yes, yes. Tony drawled out. She's the one that gave me a ride to Vegas. She was on vacation doing something in your company. Naruto casually answered. This time, it's Tony's turn to take a double take. You mean there was a spy in the company and you didn't tell me? Tony said in mock seriousness. Get over yourself. You know you have spies in your company. I bet you even know them. Naruto said before facing Pepper. Quick. How many spies are there in all your US-based main company facilities? 127. Pepper said, a little shocked. How the hell can someone know that they knew about the spies? A whole new secret division had been made just to keep that a secret. Naruto then faced Happy and asked. How many are corporate spies? 96. Happy replied. If Pepper has no problem revealing what they know, there's no way he would raise a fuss now. Wrong. Only 84 of what you know are corporate spies. Other countries sent the rest. Naruto said. That revelation concerned Pepper. How can Naruto know what they do and don't know? But the revelations are not over. On top of the 127, there are also 33 deep cover spies that you haven't discovered yet. As for the whole Stark conglomerate, there are 2,866 spies in total. The one I asked out for a date, she just went in and took care of a deep cover spy from China you didn't know about. I say that's a positive mark in my books. Naruto finally finished, leaving everyone gobsmacked. Rodi was the first one to recover. He immediately stood up and drew his gun, aiming it directly at Naruto, who just kept eating. Who are you and what did you do before? Rodi asked. If the man is as skilled in combat as Tony makes him out to be, he can only be three things, ex-special forces, mercenary, or an operator, which is a more combat-oriented spy. All of which doesn't precisely inspire relaxing th thoughts in their current predicament. Pepper rapidly pulled Morgan away from the unfolding situation, her only thought is to keep her safe. Tony and Happy are trying to defuse the crisis to keep them from escalating. As I said before, I am Naruto Uzumaki, and I was a freelance contractor. Naruto answered slowly. Freelance contractor is another term used for mercenary or assassin. Rodi stated while getting a little more twitchy-fingered. Everyone is now seriously worried about what would happen next. Damn. Is that what that means? I guess that's why my date was tensed when I said that. Naruto mused. Rodi saw that Naruto's attention is slipping off from him, so he snapped his fingers to get it back again. Oh, hey. Where was I? Freelance contractor. Happy helpfully added. Right. Naruto said while giving Happy an appreciative nod. I really was a freelance contractor. Like I would do almost any job. From menial tasks like house cleaning and face painting all the way to the harder ones like search and retrieval and bodyguard jobs. Hell, one time, I helped build a bridge while protecting a drunk architect. Good times. Naruto finished describing his job description while having a nostalgic look on his face. What the hell kind of job is that? Rodi asked, not thinking there's a job that does all that. Told you. Freelance contractor. Naruto answered while looking at Rodi like he's stupid. So, you did bodyguard jobs? Is that why you approached Tony? Rodi asked, still trying to figure out Naruto. Nope. Didn't even know him then. I just figured out who he is when I traveled. Happy decided to ask something that's been bugging him and Pepper. 
Rhodey already started asking anyway. How did you, did you find out about the inner workings of Stark Industries? Two words. Drinking game. Naruto said like it explained everything. When he saw no one got it, he continued. A lot of your employees are lightweight. I met some during my travels. When I figured out they work for you, I decided I want to know ask more questions. It kind of spiraled from there. Pepper latched on to what he said and said. No one would just tell you sensitive corporate secrets. Hey. People just kind of trust me. I'm still staying here, am I? Naruto stated the obvious. He got you there. Tony said towards Pepper which just irked her. With all that cleared up, Rhodey put that gun away. Everyone sit down, and let's eat before the food gets any colder. Rhodey holstered his gun, but still looking at Naruto warily. Pepper sat Morgan back on her chair, and thought about how can it be so different from just adding one person in the scenario. Happy is thinking about what Naruto said about the spies in the company. So now everything has chilled out, we can now discuss something more important, about someone's date with a venerable super spy. He said, oozing with giddiness. So, what's your plan? I don't know. I've only been on a few dates, and my knowledge doesn't seem to apply this time. What? That won't do for my business partner. Let me give you some advice. Tony sagely said while pushing Naruto out of the room. There's no way in hell he'll discuss these things in front of Pepper. Pepper saw how excited Tony was and knew immediately that it would be a recipe for disaster. James. Can you just go with them? Don't let Tony get overboard. Pepper requested. On it. Rhodey said before standing up and following the pair. Triskelion, Washington, D.C. January 28, 2007, 1300 H. Local. An older man in a suit is pacing back and forth inside the director's office in the Triskelion. He's anxiousness visible for everyone to see. His name is Alexander Pierce, the current secretary of the World Security, Security Council. He's a 5 feet 10 inches, 75 years old, Caucasian man, with dirty blonde hair and blue eyes. He worked for the State Department, where his work led him to be a candidate for the Nobel Peace Prize, which he turned down. His impressive resume fast-tracked him to be a secretary for the World Security Council. He used his position to nominate Nick Fury as the new director, which formed some type of friendship between the two. But of course, there are always wolves dressed as lambs. Pierce is secretly an undercover Hydra agent recruited during his time in the State Department. He's the highest position mole of Hydra in the Shield and the U.S. government. His job is to subtly recruit agents for Hydra as well as ensure the organization is hidden until they are ready to show themselves. The reason Pierce is in Fury's office is that he heard that his private jet has landed. The fuck-up in Budapest already cost them Bloom, one of Hydra's most effective finance administrators, and now he heard they have nothing to show for it. He was the one that alerted the Hydra's high council about Romanov's impromptu mission. The council immediately pounced on the opportunity to grab Romanov in hopes of finding out who the information broker called Nine Tails is. His sources told him about Romanov, Barton, Coulson, and even Fury himself knowing who the Nine Tails himself, with Romanov being the most likely. Fury supposedly saw a photo of the Nine Tails face, but there was only one copy, and it is heavily guarded. The whole plan in Budapest was to capture Romanov and force her to tell them what she knows while using Barton as a bargaining chip. They wouldn't even try to do something as daring before, but desperate times call for drastic measures. The Nine Tails is just becoming too big of a problem only to be considered a nuisance. The son of a bitch has managed to decrease their income by as much as 60% in just the first year he's been active. Terrorist cells, drug cartels, government financial overflow, and corporate profits, through off-the-book operations are being taken down one by one by selling undisputable evidence to the authorities. They can't even control them in the shadows anymore since Nine Tails just goes with another group if they don't act on the information. That's why they also sent their ultimate weapon, the Winter Soldier, to make sure everything goes smoothly. 
The plan in Budapest was going as planned when the Ninetales himself decided to fix his supposed fuck-up. He never thought that killing the original seller and meeting the general themselves to ambush Romanov and Barton would call for the Ninetales to show himself. He would usually be happy to know that Hydra could finally capture or kill him, but the whole thing was literally a bloodbath. Only the Winter Soldier managed to escape, but his metal arm was turned into a venerable pile of scrap. The only good thing that happened was that the Ninetales surrendered himself when he urged Fury to send reinforcements in the guise of helping the team the moment Bloom went dark. He watched the live feed of the guards bringing Ninetales in the Omega Cell, excited to finally the face of the man who's fucking with them, but he guessed his excitement came by too soon. No one can remove the mask and the man himself won't remove it, so they were forced to leave it on. Pierce also watched Fury interrogating the Ninetales, but Fury closed the mic off before he went in. He can't even use a lip-reading program since Fury is facing away from the camera, and the Ninetales was still wearing the goddamned mask. In the end, Fury placed the cell on lockdown, effectively cutting the feed off. When it resumed, everyone was a little shell-shocked, and the Ninetales was nowhere to be seen. Preliminary reports from the RAF said that the man was never imprisoned in the first place, only a clone was placed inside the cell. Only one thing caused his anxiousness, the possibility of the Ninetales getting information on Bloom and selling it to Fury. Pierce is only there to see if Fury learns something new. Pierce turned around when he heard the door open. He saw Fury walking in with Coulson and Hill on his right and left, respectively. What the hell happened? Pierce said with as much authoritative tone as he can muster. The Ninetales never surrendered. He just left a clone behind, and that's who we caught. Fury said smoothly while walking towards his desk. As for Budapest, I say he did us a favor, although he could try to be a little cleaner. Is there anything you found out about Budapest? Pierce asked, keeping a calm demeanor. If Fury found out about Hydra, they might need to push forward with their plan even if Project Insight still has at least five years before completion. They're an organized paramilitary group, and they killed the original seller just to ambush my team. We haven't found out more about them, but I will find out how they knew about the mission. Fury said with conviction. Pierce was immediately on high alert. The only reason Fury still hasn't found out about them was because they stay well away from his radar. Let me handle that one. I'll assign Garrett or Sitwell on it. You already have too much on your plate already. Pierce suggested. Hoping if he assigned it to either of them, they can control the investigation. Sure, go ahead. But I want a copy of every report they send out. Fury said. Of course. Pierce said while secretly releasing a sigh of relief. Did you find out about anything on this Nine Tails? Cause he's got to be stopped, or at least work for us. He's making everyone look bad. He asked, hoping to get a new lead. Not much. The only new information I have is that he liked fucking with people and has eyes and ears everywhere. He implied that he only showed up in Budapest since he saw a different man show up as the seller. Other than that, I have no idea and I hate not knowing something. Pierce processed the information and came up with one conclusion. If they mess another one of his intelligences, they can make him show up. Before I leave, why did you lock down the cell? Because he said he could get out any time. I just wanted to be sure he can't. I guess it was no use after all since it popped into a cloud of smoke after a while. Fury answered, mixing lies and truth. All right. I'll let Garrett handle the investigation. He's just traveling around. It's easier for him to get some info. I'll see you some other time, Nick. Pierce said before leaving the room. Silence permeates the room until Fury walked over to his desk and pushed a button. It was one of the personal features Fury added to the office. It will cut off all forms of outgoing communication in the office, even hardline, making it impossible to eavesdrop in it. 
The only way to get something is to leave a remote recording device inside the room and retrieving it for later. Add Garrett and Sitwell to the list. Fury ominously ordered when he was sure no one else could listen in. Already added, sir. Coulson said a little subdued. He and Sitwell were classmates inside S.H.I.E.L.D. Academy and grew to be friends. How many does that make it? Fury asked, already knowing the answer. Three. Pierce, Sitwell, and Garrett. What are we talking about, boss? Maria Hill finally interjected, not appreciating being left out of the conversation. Maria Hill is a 5 feet 8 inches, 25-year-old Caucasian woman with black hair and blue eyes. She was personally hired directly by Fury two years ago from the army. Her sharp mind and eye for details led her to become one of the fastest rising stars in the agency. She's being groomed by Fury to be the next deputy director since Coulson wants to remain to be a field agent. Her current job is to be Fury's secretary as well as lead some missions in her free time. Funny you should ask Hill because we're going to need your help. But first, let me ask you a question. Fury said while fixing her with an intense stare. Sure, boss. Hill answered. If Fury asked you to do something, you don't say no since it usually deals with matters of national security. What would you do when I say Hydra is growing inside of S.H.I.E.L.D.? Fury asked. Hill had to pause to process what Fury said. After a few seconds, she finally decided to answer the question with her own. What? That's it for this reading. Hit like and subscribe for a free ticket pass going to the different worlds of anime fanfictions. Looking forward to having you on board again.